more women are represented in higher education than, than males are. Um, I can't remember the date, maybe Nick knows when we actually, when, when the ratio flipped, <laughs> but it is the case, it is the case everywhere that most colleges uh, will have more female students than male students. And part of it, I think, is absolutely what you're talking about, that there are sort of traditional cultural roles that people play. Um, and the fact that we are largely agrarian area can, can have that effect. I don't think that Governance Council raised that point as a problem necessarily, that the ratio should be reversed or, or, or any of that more just to indicate that there is a population out there that is not being served by the college and potentially could be. So in terms of recruitment efforts, that may be something that, that the college wants to consider. Yeah, I'm not saying that it's a problem. I'm just saying that it there's uh, environmental factors out there that weren't taken in consideration with the data. Um, I know my son, he goes to school and the teachers, they always talk about how they have one year, they can have more females going to school than males. And then the next year it will be completely different where the female or the male ratio boosts up compared to the female ratio. Yeah, I, I think at any one given class level, you're, you're likely to see a variation like that. Okay. Um. Any other questions you guys have for Joshua and Nick? Uh, so when, when this data was collected, this is more for, I don't know. When this data was collected, was it specifically going to, um, the target was to be used during the strategic planning or it was just a general data collection? Now you're talking about the, are you talking about the, the backgrounder document that's giving demographics or are you talking about the survey? Actually both. Both? Sure. Uh, they're both collected for the strategic planning effort. Um, we do make demographic information available um, on our website and also by request um, as needed but we don't usually go into quite this much detail. I mean, that is, I think a 16 page document. It's a lot, it's a lot to be hit with all at once. Um, so usually we wouldn't produce that hefty of a document and just throw it at people and say, what do you think? Um, the survey, we also do regular survey efforts, but this survey in particular was to serve the strategic planning uh, needs of the college. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions, you guys? Seems Can like I students. Ask you a question? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, what did you, how was this introduced to all of you, these documents, other than the email, which I saw? Um, how was this introduced and what was your response to, to being given these documents and asked to, to weigh in? Uh, okay, so for me, if I recall it correctly, um, this, I got to see this through the emails before our governance council meeting, they like review these documents and we're going to talk about them during the meeting. And that's how I got to be introduced about it. But I remember filling out the survey uh, like a, a while back. And I'm, I was, I'm not sure if I, di I did have um, the knowledge that was going to be used for strategic planning. I do, not, I do not remember that, but I remember filling it out 
And uh, the next thing I know, I read it in the email during Governance Council email, and uh, we re reviewed it during Governance Council meetings. Others may chime in about how they got to encounter with it. I'm very similar to Sarah. Um, got in an email before a Governance Council meeting and looked over it briefly and didn't quite understand it. And then they reviewed it in the Governance Council, and that seemed to help it make sense. Yeah, I received it through the email as the same as Shiloh and Sarah. Um, I mean, it kind of made point blank sense on what you were looking for. Other than that, um, I don't really have much to say because it's not like it was too, it, it's like a typical survey. So what, what is it that you understand is being asked of you at this point? That's a good question. We actually had this discussion before this meeting. <laughs> um considering uh considering how we received the information and how we asked it to present it we i myself personally when i read it it kind of gave me the information on, on like uh, the bigger picture of what is happening in the community and at the community college as well but um presenting it like in this context, I feel like my job here is just to present it to the students and ask them if there, there is anything missing. So that's what we did in the first session. And um, we got some comments, but not really much. And today we do not have quite many students. So that's, that's how it is. I would like to recognize um, Susanna joined the meeting. Oh, yeah. Hey, Susanna. Hi. And Amy joined as well. Uh, does that answer your question, Joshua? It does. I, you know, I, uh, I I'm just, I'm curious because I think a lot of different constituent groups understand this process to differing levels of, of uh, you know, under, understanding how it all sort of wraps together. Um, and as I said before, that it, it's a thick document and it's a lot to be hit with all at once. So, Originally, I I wasn't aware that we would be sending this much raw information out, um, and that the conversations would be more about conclusions and priorities that the governance council had arrived on. So my concern right now is that you have enough context to be able to understand what's been given to you that you can have the conversations that you want to have. Um, like you mentioned, it's a big document, and uh, for me and my colleagues, Shiloh and, and Becca, we had to go through it like several times to, to actually kind of understand it. So if I'm being honest, I'm not sure if students who are coming in just for 30 minute session are going to understand it and actually give um, some strong inputs on it, but it's good to to still present it to them and uh, maybe let them know that it's it's happening or let, let them know about the process going on. Yeah, you know, um, I don't know, Nick, maybe you wanna chime in on this. To, to me, these sort of constituent meetings maybe serve two purposes. 
Um, one is to give you information and to try to hear from you as a group, students as a group, uh, to see whether we have drawn the right conclusions as to those kind of top line priorities, right? But the other thing is just to be very transparent about what's going on. Uh, because we don't want to give the impression that leaders at the college or the governance council or you know anybody else is just coming up with things and on their own, that, that we are making an attempt to hear from people, students and faculty members and staff and the outside community. And it's a complicated and messy process, but we, we are trying to be as transparent about that and, and as open about it as we possibly can. Um, so I, I think that that's one thing I would love for all of you to take away. Um, but if there is something we've missed, if you look at those conclusions that Governance Council came up to and say, well, that's bunk, right? Uh, nobody I know <laughs> is concerned about this. We're all worried about this other thing. Well, we want to hear that. Okay, yeah. We hope our students will be kind enough to give their inputs on it. <laughs> and with that being said, having new students here today, we can just jump right into the PowerPoint, right, Shiloh? Correct. Okay, great. And with that being said, uh, Joshua and Nick, we like uh, the data we're going to present in the in the in the in the slide shows it's not the whole data because it's huge and it's not just enough to be understood in one sitting so we're just gonna show like two questions and that's it okay yep okay mm. do you need somebody to share the screen sarah yes please if you can I can share it too if need be. I think. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yes. And I can see the messages as well. Okay. Okay, well, again, welcome students and everybody else for joining us today. Today is the session, the second session for um, for strategic planning inputs from students. So as Becca is going to be working on um, the PowerPoints to work, I want to introduce our students who are present here today to strategic planning, I mean, governance council. So govern, what is governance council, which is the, okay. Thank you, Becca. So what, first of all, uh, the strategic planning is being done by the governance council. And um, you may wonder what governance council is. Governance Council is just a group of um, representatives from different constituents on campus, uh, students, staff, faculty, campus administrators, and Hispanic caucus. They come together and their role is to work on uh, college-wide issues and make recommendations on how those um, issues can be solved and their, role, their main role is not making decisions. It's just gathering information, use the information they were given from different perspectives on campus and make uh, recommend uh, solutions on how those issues uh, can be solved. 
Uh, and that's why uh, Governance Council is working on um, the strategic planning right now, among other things they do, like budget alignment and other stuff. So the role of the Governance Council in the strategic planning is basically here, try to make, uh, as Joshua mentioned, to be transparent in uh, the decision-making process. They hear from all the parts of the college, they gather in input and use the input to recommend um, potential solutions, to potential goals on how it can be done. So right now on Governance Council, we are trying to gather information on um, how we can make uh, plans for um, ways the college to operate in the next three years. Next. And the purpose of the strategic planning is, first of all, like to make future plans for the college and in include um, more equity in the process of how the college operates and also encourage participatory governance to make sure everybody's voice is heard, um, whether it's the people on the campus or in the community and uh, also to foster continuous improvement as for anybody and or any organization there is always room for improvement so strategic planning is basically there to make plans according to the current situation but also be there to improve those plans as needed to meet um, needs of the community and then um, next so Shaiba, would you take us through why the three-year plan? You're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so why a three-year plan? Um, well, part of it is due to the current state of the world right now. It would be hard to near impossible to plan for more than a three-year plan. Um, it'll give us in three years time to readjust and look at where we're at. And um, yeah, that's the main reason for that. Can we go to the next slide, please? Alrighty, so we are currently in phase one of the strategic planning process. We are gathering information to determine our focus and direction about the strategic planning process. When we hit phase two, we'll start looking at what our goals are for the strategic planning and what the outcomes for that information we've gathered are. And then phase three, we'll be looking and monitoring what those goals are. So does anybody have any questions at this point or are we good to continue? And if you do, you can put them in the chat. You can email Sarah or me personally, and we can discuss with you that way too. Alrighty, so now we are going to look at some of the data. The two documents are the WWCC Strategic Planning Demographic Backgrounder document and the Walla Walla Community College Climate and Needs Assessment Survey. So we took a couple screenshots of those and put them into this PowerPoint. Um, so that's the data we'll be looking at is from those documents. All righty, Sarah, do you wanna go on the data here? Yeah, okay, so for those who are here in the beginning, uh, we mentioned that this survey was, was long and it provides uh, very informative information and it's not easy to just take it in in just one sitting. So we try to just take like uh, just few few tables or few information, few data to to share with you guys, and we hope to hear from you on what you think, and maybe it's going to encourage you to even um, ask more questions about the data that is not presented, or encourage you to go read the whole thing. Hopefully, so. Um, starting from the community survey, like well, data from our community. In Walla Walla, we have um, 60, above 60,000 population and, and other counties as it's shown in the 
in the table there. And at the community college, we have the total of 2,864 students who are divided into, you can go to the next, well, sure. Um, actually, we can, let's go back, please, sorry. Sarah, yes. could I jump in here for a second and ask yes. Joshua a question if possible about the data here? Um, so in Asotin County, did that take into um, consideration the Lewiston two out of Asotin County because of how close we are and how many students do come from Lewiston? No, uh, that's across the border in Idaho. Okay. Uh, and is outside of our our service area, as, as they call it, the Fort County area within Washington State. Uh, we do get some students from there, but it's not included in, the, in these figures. I was just wondering, because it seems that Elsie Valley is so close together, practic it's practically one city. For those of you who've never been here, Lewiston and Clarkston are there's just a bridge and a river separating the two towns. So you practically treat them as one town. Right. So in, just, in the same way that in the Walla Walla campus, we're about a 10 minute drive from Oregon. So <laughs> yes, we are very much on the border and, and our students come from, from all over. Awesome, thank you. I was just wondering if that took that into account. I see, um, I see something from this data as well, dealing with the median age range. And then when we get to, or when you look at the other report, um, you have a lot of um, people who are in between this age gap. I think it ranges from 30, the 35 to the um, 50, I, I wanna say in between there, I'm not really sure because I do not have the report in my face, um, but they were the lowest numbers of the individuals who went to the community college as well. So would that um, play into the numbers as well? Because if you're having median ages here, but then we don't service them as at college, or is that just more of the worker, the people who are going to work at that point and not looking at college? So you're talking about say on the on what I think is probably the next slide where you show by the age groups. Right, it's the age group and then dealing with the median age here. Um, so you see in the county area and then you come over and you see the median age and it ranges from the 37.1 up to the to the 49.4 and then you look on the other data sheet where um, the students who are actually attending college and then you see how low their numbers are and I think it ranges anywhere between like four and a half to maybe 12%. Um, and I just didn't know if because most of the individuals who hit that age ga gap are going to be, again, uh, dealing with more environmental factors of working, or if that is just another area where we're underrepresented it again. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, the, the median age is just an attempt to get one one you know, grab one, one understanding of, of the age of the population, but the, it can vary. Uh, and to some degree, we show that, like I said, on the next slide where you have the, the different age groups and the, the age distribution that way. Uh, for the counties, I don't recall what, how much variance there is, but it's an entire population. So it is including, you know, children all the way up through uh, retirees. Um, we, unlike maybe Whitman say, you know, we, we, we do get older students, uh, people who have been in the workforce and then, um, maybe want to pursue a different line, uh, or upgrade job skills. Um, so it is, our median age tends to be a little higher. I don't know that I would look at that and say we're not represented. 
I don't know, Nick, maybe you have something to chime in on here. That that the age isn't what I would look for necessarily, but it's important to just recognize how we compare more for for context than for finding a, a fault. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Okay. Okay, so um, in Walla Walla, we have, on Walla Walla campus, we have 2,001 students. 56 of them are female and 36% of um, student of color, 7% who, who reported disability and all those other percentages. So going to the bigger picture of both campuses, and the next slide. Yeah, so um, as, as, as we saw in the previous one, like, uh, we have Walla Walla campus being close to a thousand students and Claxton being 428. And when you go into the details, um, that's where you see we have a large percentage of our students being um, workforce. And um, the next um, group being the academic transfer. So when we look at the needs and the responses in the next the, in the next um, data, that is more specific to the college. Maybe you guys you can keep this in mind. But um, does anybody have any questions so far? Okay, hearing none, let's keep moving. I can talk for a second if you'd like, sir. Go ahead, please. Awesome. So data review here. Um, the Governance Council reviewed the Walla Walla Community College's strategic planning demographic background and found these trends. So this is out of the whole strategic demographic background or document. They reviewed it in Governance Council, and these were the main points they found. There's a decline in enrollment in Walla Walla Public Schools that mirrors the national decline in schools. The Walla Walla Public Schools have a 42% Latinx students and WWCC has 25%. This suggests that there's a gap in who's recruiting. And there's also a disproportion of female to male students. So I think we kind of discussed this a minute ago with the work source and how male students may be more likely to go work on a farm directly out of high school. So not quite sure, but we should do the best we can to keep that proportional. And I believe that's what we're trying to do. And there appears to be a need for an intersection between the need to attract new kinds of students and providing them with the support to be successful. Next slide, please. And then any input, do you, have you all agreed with the data so far? Do you think that it reflects the college accurately? What other things would you like to see that are not reflected in the data? And do you have any other questions or observations? We would like to hear from our students who are present with us. Not to call out on anybody, but um, we really value the inputs on this. The, the, the governance council is not gonna, if they make decision from what they think, it's not gonna be that broad or more, yeah. So we, we, we really, we are seeking inputs from students especially. Next 
okay, if they are shy to um, to bring their, their inputs in this meeting, we are going to, to share our emails in the chat. If they have any questions, they can just um, feel free to send the, the inputs they have anytime and it will be taken to the governance council. But we can keep going. Do you want, I can go on the status side if you guys would like. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry in the background if you guys hear my son playing his video. So, um, so hopefully it doesn't get too loud. But these are the top selections by relationship when it comes to the three strongest aspects or services of the college. I, we highlighted the current students because that is mostly who we are working towards with, um, with the governance council for you guys. And so the top three choices that the students chose was student support, quality of instruction, and preparing our students for employment for further education. Um, which makes sense after you see the after you've seen the last um, the last bit of data when it came to the workforce with most students going towards workforce. Yeah, Shiloh. Um, so this is something I was going to ask Joshua that we ended up having asked in the last meeting. Is there's a um, big jump between that 55.07% for quality instruction to 26.09% for preparing your students for future employment? So what we were thinking, if that 26.09% thinks that the school is good at preparing students for future employment, that would mean 70, 74-ish percent do not necessarily think that's one of the top selections. Is that, am I looking at that correct, Joshua, or? Well, I'll, I'll, have, I'll just say this on the, the percentages. So the question, if you look up there, it says select up to three. And some people selected three and some people did not. So, and some people skipped it entirely. So the percentages are out of the choices. Um, so you don't wanna, you can't refer back and say like 56% of students, it was 56% of the responses that came in supported student support. Um, but even though what I'm worried about is this number is going to get looked at and go, well, we don't need to work on preparing, having advisors that help or continuing that area the, because it's going to look at, well, that's already in the top three. We don't need to. That was one of my concerns there is that's going to get looked at and go, oh, it's in the top three, but it's only a 26.09%. That right. was the, the idea that you'd say, oh, we're already doing this well, so we, we forget about it. Yeah, I, I take that point. I, I take that point. Thank you. Does any student have any question about this data? Any other students? Okay. Um, on the next slide. We have the three points where uh, students thought there was the weakest aspects or service, which um, a lot of students said none of the above. Your interactions with other at college and decision making by college leadership. Do students feel this is accurate or not accurate? And this could be open to anybody to speak if you would like to, or your silence could indicate that this information is pretty precise. It seems like it's pretty on point. Um, 
I could see how like the interactions with others at the college might be low because we're in a COVID setting. So it's like, we're not really interacting as much. And it also like um, echoes like the decline in the clubs and stuff. If that's what that's talking about. I'm not sure if, if they mean like interactions with like staff or interactions with just everyone. Thank you. I also, I, I like what I don't get about this graph either is the none of the above. <laughs> um, like what it, what is that? It, it, does that reflect into the open-ended questions that students were able to answer? Or is this just saying that a lot of students don't find that Walla Walla Community College has weak points? I, so I, I'm i glad you brought this one up on the slide because this is the one I most had a question for this group. Um, so selecting none of the above, you know, we took it to be that what we thought of as the possibilities and listed out in that question, none of those really resonated. Whereas with all the other groups across college, they were able to latch on to, to one of those at least as, or three of them as their top three none of these really resonated. So we are not doing a good job right out of the bat in figuring out what, <laughs> what's not working for students. Um, and, and there was an other where people could specify things, but only 8% of people selected that. And there wasn't enough of a pattern to really figure out, you know, so what is the weakest part of the college? So- it's I'd just like to ask everybody here, what do you think are some of the, the weak aspects? Where, or, you know, where could the college improve? I would say virtual instruction. If I had to say college is general, I mean, it's not going away, obviously, even if when we go back to normal, you can see it's going to be continued to some extent. And it does seem there's such a wide gap in how, from what I've heard, some classes are taught really good virtually, some are just really bland, some are, it, there doesn't seem to be the consistency there used to be with in-person classes. That's just me speaking. I've heard it slightly resonated from students, but that's just more my personal experience so far. I would agree with that one too. Like if we're going to be on virtual for, I mean, who knows how much longer, like it is really difficult to take like a full course load plus work um, and then have to sit through and watch like an hour and a half lecture on YouTube on how to do like pre-calculus speaking from personal experience. Um, because it's just, it's just, yeah, it's, it's tough. And I don't know if other students feel the same way about some of the more like difficult classes that are online. Um, it's, you know, I personally like learn better when I'm being taught like live with, uh, with certain subjects and like the videos you know, you can't really ask questions when you're watching the video. So it's like, you just have to go through it and figure it out. So it seems like those classes are taking twice as long to complete. And, you know, it, it kind of creates like a barrier, especially for people who have kids, who have other jobs, but yet still need these classes because they're requirements for where they want to move up into. My question is, is are we able to conduct data on um, outside of this meeting? I understand that this is a meeting where we were supposed to collect data, but not everyone has the time. They have outside barriers that do not allow them to come to this meeting. Is there a way that we could find out what their options are for none of the above, like what they might think their weakest points are? Or is that something that's probably not possible?
Um, well, I'd say that our opportunities for data collection in this, at least as in the strategic planning effort, are pretty constrained because we're on a short time frame. Um, but you know, it's the hope of this and the previous forum that was held with students. And I think that there's going to be more opportunities in the future for people to come and, and speak their mind. We can certainly try to gather opinions that way. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I guess I, it just lets That's me know me. that the time frame for strategic planning is really tight. So it's it's either now or never. <laughs> like, yeah, not to say that this is a once and done. Though. I mean, there there will be more strategic planning, and there will be more um, more surveys and more forums in in the future. So it, this isn't a closed book. Uh, Josh, if I may ask, um, when you guys do more surveys, not just this one, you 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 have done many surveys around the school. How would you? say the response rate was on this one was it like a good number was it a bad number average considering what you have done in the past yeah so uh that's a great question uh i i'm thrilled anytime we have anywhere near 300 responses from students and the fact that we had over what was it i think over 330 um we had enough for a statistically representative sample of students, um, which means you could feel fairly confident in the answers reflecting the, the larger population. But students skip certain questions, everybody does. Um, so we didn't have enough to, to really feel completely confident for every question, right? Um, there's some technical stuff I could get into, but it doesn't matter. Uh, I was thrilled with the with the, the level of response to this. The only survey I can think of, the only two surveys where we had a higher response rate than this was the first time that we tried to do a survey asking about uh, housing and food insecurity. Uh, we, we had a lot of students responded to that. And the survey that we did in the spring to see how everyone was doing with our transition online, we had a we just had a flood of responses to that. Um, but then the next, you know, we did the pretty much that same survey in fall, and it was, I think we just had barely over a hundred. So it it really comes and goes. Okay, that that thank you. Um, Maybe you don't have an answer for this, but maybe you may have a theory. Do you, you, you mentioned that some students, well, good number of students skipped some questions. Um, do you have a theory of why they may have? Are those questions hard for students to answer or not understand the question? Like, do you well, have any theories? Let, let me reverse that on you. you. You took the survey. Did you skip any questions? <laughs> I tried not to. I tried not to. I think people answer the questions that they feel they have a strong opinion about or they feel is important for them to voice their opinion. Um, also, if the survey is very long, people tend to skip the questions towards the end. So you ask the important ones close up. Thank you. Sarah, Shiloh, do you guys want to go or do you want me to continue going? I can I can go. Uh, so from the data which was long and you guys saw just a few questions from it um overall the governance council um these are the the take they got from it they thought the pandemic affected um or raised some concerns in the students staff and faculty 
the job security and budgets was a concern. Um, are people working while attending school was another thing. Um, classified staff responses were overall positive compared to other groups. And um, uh, on other side, the classified staff gave the lowest positive response. It was, yeah, in, in summary, there was this connect between uh, responses from classified staff to other um, constituents who responded to the survey. And 65% um, of responses uh, from full-time faculty were more positive and encouraging. Uh, there is a need of understanding on how decisions are made. So basically, we need to communicate more. Like this was the start of this conversation. Uh, like Joshua mentioned, we need to promote transparency. And that was uh, heard from different groups. And uh, in the spirit of transparency, students, please give us your um, input on this data. Do you think it reflects what you feel or not? Did we miss anything? I thought you did a wonderful job. Um, a point on that previous slide, just uh, we're guilty of using some jargon. I, I don't expect most people would know who's a classified staff member and who's an exempt staff member. These, these are all um, you know, HR designations and probably unimportant for you to, to think about. But I, I thought you did very well presenting it. And certainly if people feel that we missed something important that the president and the decision makers at the school need to consider during planning, I would hope that you let us know. On that spirit, actually, Joshua, would you like to help students understand what classified staff are or how they're different from faculty and yeah, that? I'm, I'm gonna pass that to Nick. <laughs> sure. So classified staff <clears throat> under Washington state law, they're, 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 they fall under the civil servant category and that's basically like a state worker. And um, <clears throat> they typically play um, uh, support roles across the institution, whether that's, you know, at, at um, community college or a university or even like a large state agency, like, you know, Office of Financial Management or something like that. And, and then, you know, faculty obviously um, um, are responsible for our core mission and that is instruction. And so they're the ones who are, um, you know, in the classroom, though um, there are also um, other faculty that do not have, a, have teaching as their primary role. So that's like um, our counselors are faculty and also we have librarian that's faculty. Um, and then um, exempt employees are um, administrative employees. Um, and you would find like, you know, Joshua and I are both um, ex classified as exempt employees. Um, Many advisors are exempt employees, um, and those who um, who are employed by the college and are in like you know like a leadership position, like the director of financial aid, the registrar, um, deans are exempt employees, vice presidents, and of course the president. I think that kind of I think that covers it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions from students or observations or concerns?
Okay. Um, I believe that's what we had for this session. Thank you so much for attending. We appreciate students who showed up and you guys, your, your inputs. Um, any other question or ideas or anything before we end this session? Hearing none, uh, thank you so much Joshua and Nick for joining us today and answering all the questions we had. I personally feel like I understand this better more than I did before you guys came in. So thank you so much. And thank you students for the inputs. Um, we'll keep you updated on the, on the process of governance council and um, everything else. We hope to be transparent as, as, as transparent as possible. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.